Have you ever been uh, disappointed that you were disappointed? A couple weeks ago, I went to Niagara Falls, and uh, while I was still quite a distance away, I couldn't help but think, um, is that it? I mean, it was a waterfall, like, yeah, and it was pretty big and whatnot, and, and even when you're a few uh, miles away, you could still see the spray coming up, and I was like, okay, that's pretty cool, but then it's like, is this really all that it is? I mean, I couldn't help but think that I had seen a taller or bigger waterfall somewhere else. And so I was pretty disappointed that I was disappointed, especially considering the fact that this was supposed to be one of the, you know, largest uh, attraction sites or one of the most amazing things in our continent um, and that I had heard about ever since I was in grade school and somebody really had to use the bathroom. Uh, well. I think something similar is going on here with our gospel. The Pharisee, from a distance, seems to have done everything right in life, whereas the tax collector, everything wrong. I mean, just think about it. Imagine if you had given away 10% of everything you owned, and that you gave away 10% of all the money you ever made and you fasted twice a week, every week, like it was Ash Wednesday, only to hear, I tell you, the corrupt government official went home justified and not you. You'd be pretty disappointed, and you'd be pretty disappointed that you're disappointed. So what's the deal here? How could someone give so much to God and yet be beat out by somebody with a less than admirable past? Well, have we ever found ourselves saying, people are just so dishonest, or people are just so rude, or incompetent, or whatever? Naturally, we get hurt by somebody and we walk away with a poor taste in our mouth for the rest of humanity. Are we correct that there are people who are dishonest or who are adulterous or who are rude? Well, yeah, of course, obviously, but uh, here's where it can kill us. It's pride. Oh God, I think thank you that I am not like the rest of humanity. No, my friends, all of us need God's mercy. All of us have sins to confess. And all of us are vulnerable to pride. If you're human, you're part of the rest of humanity. Because, I mean, have we ever lied before? Yeah. Well, then we too are dishonest. Have we ever looked at another with lust? Well, then yeah. We ourselves have committed adultery in our own hearts. Or we, have we ever been angry with somebody to the point where we call them names, whether even if it's just in our heads or in our hearts? Well, then yeah, as Jesus says, we would be liable to judgment. We too are part of the rest of humanity. But now, uh, Jesus isn't saying here that the Pharisee's fasting is therefore worthless, or that his tithing is therefore worthless, because he later also says, when you fast, and when you give alms. And he also says, give alms. Um, but rather, the point is that the sin of pride isn't just a character flaw. It's really the worst of all sins. Because in effect, it's really the opposite of the golden rule. Because pride not only prevents us from having mercy on each other, which is love of neighbor, it also prevents us from receiving God's mercy which in essence is where the love of God begins. The good news, however, 
is that true humility in the face of our own sinfulness and in the face of God's mercy, that this can wipe away all of our sins, no matter how egregious or corrupt our sins may have been in the past. Because you see, when I was at um, Niagara Falls, my disappointment was eventually washed away as well. Although at a distance, I really didn't think much of it, um, it wasn't until I was leaning over the edge right next to, just a few yards away from where the water was rushing over the cliff, that I could really appreciate why Niagara Falls was such a big deal. Because once I saw how deep the water was and the speed with which it was flowing, it was like watching dozens and dozens of swimming pools being hurled off of the edge of a cliff. And that was pretty cool. That was pretty amazing. Um, but it wasn't until I was up close and personal that I could really appreciate why it was such a big deal. And the same is true with God's mercy. From a distance, it's easy to say, yeah, yeah, you know, everybody needs God's mercy, but like, at least I'm not like the rest of humanity. You know, I never killed anybody or anything. Um, but when we're up close and personal to our own sinfulness, to our own falls, as it were, it's then that we can truly appreciate how great God's mercy is. And that from that place, we would then want to confess our sins, want to share God's mercy with others, and as a result, go to our eternal home, justified. But there's a final thing that needs to be said as well. Um, because I know that for many of us, uh, looking at our own sinfulness and our own brokenness up close and personal isn't exactly the problem. In fact, it's really the opposite. Um, that we would struggle to believe that in our own brokenness and, and seeing and knowing what we have done all too clearly that we would struggle to believe that God could ever actually forgive us. And that's what finally struck me about Niagara Falls. Because in watching the endless torrents of water being hurled off of the edge, I couldn't think that, well, surely, after this water being poured out 24-7, day after day, week after week, year after year, the lake would empty, the river run dry, and the water stop flowing. It's been going on way before I showed up there, and it'll continue to flow way after. But it doesn't stop. And as amazing as it may seem, and unbelievable as it may feel, neither does God's mercy. It never runs out. <laughs>